Hello, this will be our discussion on the respiratory disorders. Take note of the disclaimer that this is only intended for the level 3 students and this does not constitute medical advice and to be augmented by live sessions. If there are any concerns regarding this recording, please refer on the email address indicated on the slide. The first topic that we will discuss is obstructive sleep apnea. For a condition to be categorized as sleep apnea, there needs to be a duration of apneic episodes of at least 10 seconds, the frequency of which should be at least 5 times hourly. Notice the illustration on the right side of the screen which differentiates the normal breathing during sleep and an obstructive sleep apnea. If you can notice in obstructive sleep apnea, there is an obstruction of the airway on this side which is brought about by the backward movement of your tongue. Okay, whereas in normal breathing, it can be noticed that from the oral cavity, the air would go through okay, the, the lower airways without any obstruction. The same from the nasal cavity, there will be no obstruction. However, in your obstructive sleep apnea, the tongue is moving backwards, which leads to the obstruction of the airway. Now, take note that the pharynx is a collapsible organ, meaning it can be compressed by the presence of other organs or masses. Let's talk about the pathophysiology of your obstructive sleep apnea. The most common factors and the most dominant one is obesity, common among males and those who are postmenopausal among your women, and then ages 30 to 70, and among patients with large neck circumference and pharyngeal fat. If you would look at these signs and symptoms, or if you would look at these predisposing factors, I mean, Okay, you can be, it can be notable that among these uh, predisposing factors, the most common ones is that it leads to the obstruction of your airway because of the compression of your tongue or because of the enlargement of tissues or surrounding tissues. Okay? There are mechanical factors that needs to be considered in your uh, obstructive sleep apnea. Take note that during sleep, the upper airway's diameter has a tendency to be decreased. Okay? And then the muscle tone also tends to be reduced during sleep. Hence, there is a possibility for your tongue to fall backwards during sleep because of the decrease of muscle tone. Now, with all of these conditions and predisposing factors combined, there could be upper airway collapse. And because of the upper airway collapse, obstruction results. Because of that obstruction, there will be repetitive apneic episodes, as mentioned, which would be lasting at 10 seconds each and then at least 5 episodes early. Okay, so once you have these repetitive apneic episodes, this is where the main concern for OSA would set in. Okay, so your patient would have signs of insomnia. Your patient could not be able to sleep at night. Okay, there will be nocturnal awakening, especially if they're having the apneic episodes. This would result to excessive daytime sleepiness. So they are unable to focus in their academic works. They are unable to focus on their workload because of excessive daytime sleepiness. Also, your patient would have the tendency to have morning headache, intellectual deterioration, personality changes such as your irritability, impotence, and then common among pediatric patients is your enuresis or their inability to control their urine output okay, or inability to control their urine excretion. Now, with the apneic episode, recall that apnea is the cessation of breathing. So because of the apneic episode, it results to your hypoxia. Hypoxia is the decrease of oxygen levels in the bloodstream. This is why it makes it an emergency for us to manage your obstructive sleep apnea. So with hypoxia would come your hypercapnia, which is the increase of your carbon dioxide levels. Now, there is also a condition that we refer to as polycythemia. Your polycythemia, as we have discussed previously, is the excess in the production of immature red blood cells. Again, when I say polycythemia, it is the excess in the production of immature red blood cells. This is triggered by your hypoxia because if the body is having hypoxia, the amount of oxygen that goes to your kidney will also be decreased. Because of the decreased amount of the oxygen that goes to your kidney, the kidney perceives the need for the production of additional red blood cells. Hence, it would release the substance that we refer to as erythropoietin. Once the substance erythropoietin is triggered, it would go or target the bone to release or manufacture for additional red blood cells. Okay? However, in conditions like your obstructive sleep apnea, this process tends to be lengthy, hence the patient has the tendency to have polycythemia, meaning the patient would have a lot of red blood cells. However, these red blood cells tend to be immature due to the rush, quote-unquote, 
of your bone marrow to produce for the demand of the body. Other than that, okay, with hypoxia and hypercapnia combined, it can result to vasoactive factors and can increase your left atrial pressure. So when we say vasoactive factors, these are factors that can increase also pulmonary pressure. Okay, these are factors that can increase your pulmonary pressure. If this continues, it will result to a condition that we refer to as core pulmonal. In core pulmonal, there will be abnormalities in the right side of the heart due to the abnormalities brought about by the lungs. A common example would be an excess of the fluids in the lungs. So instead, okay, instead of the fluid going towards the right atrium, or I mean going towards the left atrium, the tendency of the fluid is to backflow towards the right atrium. Because of this backflow towards the right atrium and right ventricle, ventricular hypertrophy may occur. And later on, that condition is referred to as core pulmonar. So in your core pulmonal, it is a cardiac manifestation that is a result of pulmonary problems. Also, because of hypoxia, there will be sympathetic response activation. So when we say sympa, everything will be increased. Hence, you will have the risk for hypertension, the risk for myocardial infarction, and the risk for stroke. Secondary to that, you will have your dysrhythmias. Okay, now, the three S of your obstructive sleep apnea are shown on the slide. So you have snoring, sleepiness, and significant sleep apnea. So take note that the main problem in this condition is upper airway collapse that would lead to obstruction and apnea. Okay, the main problem is the upper airway collapse leading to obstruction and then repetitive apneic episodes. Now, associated factors. Okay, obstruction could be because of tonsillar hypertrophy. Hypertrophy as in enlargement of your tonsils. Other than that, abnormal posterior positioning, variation in your craniofacial features, large uvula, short neck, smoking, and oropharyngeal edema. What you can notice in short neck, smoking, oropharyngeal edema, large uvula, and then variations here, abnormal posterior positioning, and hypertrophy is that there may be an enlargement of the organ or they may be an enlargement of the surrounding tissues that result to airway obstruction. So the main problem again is airway obstruction, okay, which leads to your hypoxia. Now, there are several diagnostic studies that can be done among patients who have OSA or obstructive sleep apnea. One or the most common perhaps is your polysomnography. In your polysomnography or your PSG, this is considered to be the definitive test for sleep apnea performed during an overnight sleep study. So what the patient does is to go to the sleep clinic and then they will be sleeping there and then they will be attached to the monitors. The sensors and the monitors would monitor the brain waves of your patient, would monitor the breathing pattern of your patient. So as you can see, it monitors brain activity and eye movement and also it measures airflow through the nose. Okay, so this is how a polysomnogram would look like. So the result of your polysomnography is a polysomnogram. As you can see, okay, there is a drop of blood oxygen levels on this side because there have been a breathing event on this side. Okay, this warrants that the patient would need to have medical attention. Next, you also have your electroencephalogram, as the term implies electroencephalo. So when I say encephalo, that will be your brain. Okay, it talks about the activity of your brain or electrical activity of your brain. On the right side is your electrooculography. In your electrooculography, there is measurement of the corneoretinal okay, standing potential that exists between the front and the back of the human eye. So as you can notice, the electrodes there are attached to evaluate the eye of your patient. Next, you also have your electrocardiography. We know ECG. Electrocardiography is used to identify the presence of abnormal cardiac rhythms. On the other hand, you have the term electromyography. So in your electromyography, the depth of sleep, respiratory effort, oxygen saturation, and muscle movement are identified. Okay, so there is muscle movement. So take note, in your electromyography, there may be a chance the doctor will just be using probes for that, okay, or electrodes for that matter. However, in the case uh, commonly, okay, the doctor would insert a needle, 
for the doctor to determine the actual pressure of your or the actual movement of your muscles. So the picture below shows your electromyography and then the picture on your right shows how your ECG will be attached. Management. Since we're talking about obesity as the major factor for this disorder, the management will be weight loss, avoidance of alcohol, and then positional therapy. So in your positional therapy, this involves the use of devices that prevent sleeping on the back. And then you also have your oral appliances. Now, management. One management that can be done for our patient is the use of your MAD. Your MAD is a mandibular advancement device. Okay, so you're, just like on the picture on your left, a mandibular enhancement device is inserted to our patient's oral cavity in such a way that the mandible of your patient will be moved forward or it will be guided to move forward. Okay, and then the purpose of that is to relieve ourselves with the compression of the tongue. Next, so you have the use of your positive pressure ventilation. So this is indicated here in the slide for you to differentiate what is a positive pressure ventilation using your CPAP and then using your BiPAP. So when I say CPAP, it is continuous passive airway pressure. Okay, when I say BiPAP, it is a bi-level positive airway pressure. So what do you mean by that? Continuous positive airway pressure. Meaning the CPAP machines can only be set to single pressure that remains consistent throughout the night. On the other hand, the BiPAP, as the term implies by, the BiPAP can be set to two pressure settings for inhalation and exhalation. Okay, it can be set to two pressure settings which will allow for inhalation and expiration. Okay, or your exhalation. Now, so this is an example of your CPAP and BiPAP. Okay, so uh, take note, you cannot see the difference of CPAP and BiPAP here because that would be a setup on the machine. However, for the purpose of familiarizing yourself, this is how a CPAP would look like. Oftentimes, patients with obstructive sleep apnea will bring their CPAP in the hospital setting. So as you can see, it is just as big as nebulizer. However, the tubings may be difficult to find. So the purpose is... Okay, the purpose of that is to exert pressure to the airway in such a way that there will be no obstructive sleep apnea. Okay, so your CPAP and BiPAP are used in more severe co uh, co cases, I mean, that involves hypoxemia and hypercapnia. So once the case is severe, you would expect to see this in your patients or among your patients. Drug therapy. There are three drugs here that you might want to remember. One is modafinil. Your modafinil is considered to be a wakefulness promoting agent. Okay, it's a wakefulness promoting agent. So it can be indicated for narcolepsy due to sleep apnea by promoting daytime wakefulness. Okay, so it is augmented still by your nursing intervention. So in this case, they need to okay, have daytime wakefulness. Next, protriptyline. Your protriptyline is a tricyclic antidepressant. Okay, tricyclic antidepressant. For this medication, it is given at that bedtime and then it increases the respiratory drive and improve upper airway muscle tone. And then the next one is your midroxy progesterone, acetate and acetazolamide. Okay, these medications can use, be used to treat sleep apnea associated with chronic alveolar hypoventilation. So take note that your acetazolamide is a diuretic. Okay, so your acetazolamide would try to decrease the swelling on the lung tissues in such a way that the other drugs will be effective. Okay, you also have the procedure that we referred to as simple adenoidectomy. So when I say adenoidectomy, it is the removal of your adenoids. If you can notice in the diagram, this is located on the posterior aspect of our throat. So a simple adenoidectomy might be able to help with our obstructive sleep. You also have your uvulo palato pharyngoplasty. If you can notice, this is uvulo palato pharyngoplasty. Okay, so meaning it's one procedure. What is being done is to remove the uvula and then it would look like this. Okay, the uvula of your patient is removed and then it would look like the picture on the right. Okay, 
that would allow for the decrease of the volume of tissues in the neck cavity, hence later on with the hope that that can also aid on the obstruction that your patient is feeling. Other than that, you have your nasal septoplasty, okay, because the misalignment of your nasal septum could also be one cause of your OSA. So it needs to be repaired using the procedure referred to as nasal septoplasty. You also have your maxillo-mandibular surgery. If you can notice, there are pins and screws placed here, and then the objective of those pins and screws is to get your skull accustomed to that position in such a way that okay, it prevents obstruction of the airway. Next, you also have your tracheostomy, which could be the last resort. So in your tracheostomy, what happens is that the neck is being dilated, the neck is being exposed, and then um, there will be an incision that will be made through the trachea. And that would act as the artificial airway for our patient. Now, nursing management. We need to educate them on the risk factors. Take note that the effect of your risk factors in pulmonary disorders is said to be cumulative. Meaning, if the patient will be able to diet, that will be able to help her in short to long amount of time. Next, instruct about CPAP, BiPAP, and MAD. So, you need to instruct them as to how to troubleshoot your CPAP and BiPAP if ever there will be difficulties okay, on listening to the recording. And then, you need to have oxygen therapy. So, for this one, a high flow oxygen is usually recommended for the patient. And then educate on the risk of untreated OSA. Because oftentimes the patient would just say that, oh, it's just sleep apnea, it's just muragok. I do not want to have this treated. But if this would not be treated, it can result to hypoxia, hypoxemia. And recall our pathophysiology slide, it could lead to core pulmonal, hypertension, and all other complications. Now, let's go to the care of the client with vintage disorders. The first ventilation disorder that we'll tackle about is your pleurisy, which is another name for your pleuritis. As the term implies, pleuritis, meaning there is inflammation on both the layers of the pleura, which are your visceral and parietal pleura. Recall that it is the visceral pleura that is close to your lungs, okay? whereas the parietal pleura is on the outer surface. Now, let us familiarize ourselves with pleuritis in one slide. The most common cause of your pleuritis are the following disorders. Pneumonia, which is the infection of your lungs, upper respiratory tract infection, tuberculosis, cancer, which could be primary or metastatic. So when I say metastatic, your lung is already considered to be the secondary site of cancer because the cancer originated from other parts of the body. And then you could also have your thoracotomy. Your thoracotomy could be because of the insertion of the tube which is used to manage your other lung disorders. Now, because of these conditions, it can result to the inflammation of your pleura. Take note that your parietal pleura is rich on nerve endings. For that reason, your patient who is having pleuritis would have manifestations of pain. Now, here are the signs and symptoms that the patient will experience. One is pain on respiration that is worsened by inspiration, deep breathing, coughing, or sneezing. And then the pain is usually unilateral, and then it could possibly radiate to your shoulder and your abdomen. Okay, It also results to severe, sharp, knife-like pain, which is referred to as your pleuritic pain. Other than that, okay, during auscultation, you would have your positive pleural friction rub. And then as the fluid develops, the pain tends to decrease because the fluid would distance your parietal pleura from your visceral pleura. Okay, diagnostic test. For these conditions, the following diagnostic test could be done. One is your sputum analysis. If you would want to rule out the presence of pneumonia and then your tuberculosis, you need to do your sputum analysis to identify the causative organism for the disease. Chest x-ray is also done to evaluate the lungs. Your pleural biopsy, as the term implies biopsy, which is the mainstay diagnostic for your cancer. And then you also have your thoracentesis. So your thoracentesis could be both diagnostic or curative for this patient. So your thoracentesis can be used to identify okay, or can be used to analyze the content of the pleural fluid. 
with this diagnostic test, the following management is done to our patient. So if your patient would have pneumonia, respiratory tract infection, tuberculosis, those need to be treated. Okay, those conditions need to be treated for the inflammation of your pleura to be resolved. Okay, if your patient is complaining of too much pain, analgesics are given. Application of hot and cold compress is recommended. And then the use of your NSAIDs, one example is your indomethacine, could be of help to our patients. Okay, intercostal nerve block could also be given. So when I say intercostal nerve block, a medication, specifically an anesthetic, is given to the nerve that supplies the pleura of your patient. And the purpose of that is to sever the nerve in such a way that your patient will not be experiencing pain because it will be very painful, especially with your pleuritic pain. Now, for the nursing management, splinting. You educate your patient on how to perform splinting. So when I say splitting, that could be done by turning to the affected side because by turning to the affected side, you are splinting the affected part, okay? meaning you're trying to put pressure on the affected part. Okay? You're trying to immobilize the affected part, hence decreasing the pain experience of your patient. You may also taught your patient on how to use the hands or the pillow as splint. So when I say using the hands in the pillow as splint, it would be placing the pillow in front of your patient's chest and then placing the hands okay, crossed across your patient's chest. And then every time the patient would cough, she should be on this position to decrease the pain experience. So this is your pleuritis in one slide. Take note that the main problem that the patient is experiencing is inflammation. So this is very less likely that pleuritis would occur as a single disorder. Okay, it usually occurs with other disorders or underlying disorders. These underlying disorders need to be treated for the inflammation to be resolved. Let's go to the next disorder. That would be your pleural effusion. So when I say pleural effusion, there is collection of fluid in the pleural space. Okay, earlier in pleuritis, there is only inflammation. In your pleural effusion, there is already a collection of fluid in the pleural space. The normal amount of fluid in the pleural space is 5 to 15 ml, and it acts as lubricant. However, in some pathologic and underlying conditions, there is a tendency for this fluid to be in excess. Hence, leading to the condition that we refer to as pleural effusion. Okay, look at the picture on the right side. You can see an illustration of the lungs with pleural. Let's talk about pleural effusion. So pleural effusion is brought about by the following conditions. One is your congestive heart failure. So in your congestive heart failure, there could be an excess of the fluids in the system. And then one tendency is that, especially if it is left-sided heart failure, is for the fluid to backflow towards your lungs, resulting to pulmonary congestion and possibly pleural effusion. Then you have your tuberculosis, pneumonia, and other pulmonary infections, nephrotic syndrome, which is also characterized by fluid volume excess, and then you have your neoplastic tumors, which will be your cancers. Now, because of this condition, these conditions can result to accumulation of the fluid in the pleural cavity. Okay? There are two kinds of accumulation that may occur. The uh, accumulation could be exudative or transudative. For us to simply recall what is transudate and then exudate, a transudate is a filtrate of plasma that moves across the intact capillary walls. So this is most commonly seen among patients with heart failure. Whereas an exudate is a, an extravasation of fluid into tissues or cavity which is usually results from inflammation of bacterial products or tumors involving the pleural spaces. So when I say exudate, it's more of infection. Okay, there's a presence of pus or infection. So when I say transudate, it is usually plasma fluid. On the other hand, exudate would contain your bacterial products and tumors. So if you would look at congestive heart failure, that would usually be transudative. Looking at tuberculosis, that would be exudative. Pneumonia and pulmonary infection is more likely to be exudative. Nephrotic syndrome could either be transudative or exudative. Pulmonary infection is usually exudative again. And the neoplastic tumors is also exudative. Okay? Now, 
the signs and symptoms experienced by the patient would be dependent on the three factors. Size of effusion, meaning how many ml of water is there. The speed of the formation, did the fluid deposit within okay, an acute period of time or short period of time or a prolonged period of time. And then what are the underlying lung diseases? If the patient would have okay, pleural effusion, during auscultation, you would expect a decrease of the breath sounds. You'd also expect decrease of fremitus because of the accumulation of fluids. You also expect that during palpation, the sound will be dull and flat. Okay, again, the sound will be dull and flat due to the deposits of fluid. If the patient has pneumonia, the patient would manifest with fever and chills. Remember that fever and chills are signs of infection. Okay, your patient would also have pleuritic chest pain. If it is a malignant effusion, the patient is more likely to manifest with dyspnea, which is difficulty of breathing, or thopnea, the inability to tolerate the lying down position, and then of course, coughing. So malignant effusion, malignant effusion is common, especially if your patient would have neoplastic tumors. Diagnostic test for this includes X-ray, CT scan, and thorax synthesis. The purpose of the X-ray, CT scan, and thorax synthesis is to detect for the fluids. The CT scan will be a more accurate uh, diagnostic test or imaging study to determine the volume of fluid. On the other hand, the thorax synthesis will allow for the extraction of specimen for cytologic analysis. Okay, you can also have the lateral decubitus x-ray. The lateral decubitus x-ray is recommended okay, because this would allow for the layering out of fluids and an air fluid line would be visible. Okay, in your lateral decubitus x-ray, as the term decubitus would imply, the patient is on side-lying position. Okay, so the patient is on side-lying position. The patient is expected to lie on the affected side. Other than that, so you can have the fluid analysis as previously mentioned after extraction from thorax synthesis. Also, if you are exploring for the presence of neoplastic tumors, biopsy and cytologic analysis may be done in the laboratory setting. Okay, again, for the management. So as we have mentioned, thorax synthesis could be both diagnostic and it could also be management okay, or curative for your patient. So in the case of our patient with fluid accumulation, regardless if it is transudative or exudative, we can do thorax synthesis to extract the fluids. Okay? If a continuous drainage is needed, a placement of the thoracostomy tube can be done. The thoracostomy tube can be on place. Next, you can have your surgical pleurectomy. So these are the surgical procedures that can be done. In surgical pleurectomy, there is removal of the part of the pleura to help the to help prevent fluid from collecting in the affected area. So as the term implies pleurectomy, meaning ectomy, removal of your pleura. In this case, part of your pleura. You can also have your pleuroperitoneal shunt. When I say shunt, a shunt is usually located, okay, is a usually uh, artificial passageway for the fluids. It serves as artificial passageway for the fluid. In this case, the shunt is between the pleura, pleuro is the term there, and then peritoneum, okay, so that shunt, that means that there will be an insertion of tube from the pleural cavity going towards the peritoneum. Hence, it's referred to as pleura peritoneal shunt or your pleuro peritoneal shunt. Then you have the term chemical pleurodesis. In your chemical pleurodesis, the purpose of this is to obliterate the pleural space and prevent reaccumulation of the fluids. So when we say pleurodesis, a substance is instilled to the lungs through chest tube or thoracoscopic procedure. The chest tube is clamped for 60 to 90 minutes and the patient is assisted to several positions. And then the tube will be unclamped and may be continued for several days to promote formation of adhesions. So the bottom line for your chemical pleurodesis is the formation of adhesions. The purpose of the adhesions is to prevent fluid deposits. What will be the role of the nurses here? When your patient will undergo thorax synthesis, you need to be able to record the amount. You need to assist the patient on proper positioning during the procedure. And you need to send the specimen to laboratory for fluid analysis. Okay, the specimen might contain WBC and other substances. 
if your patient is on thoracostomy tube and then the patient would have a drainage, you need to properly manage the chest tube, which could either be drained towards a water seal chamber or the air seal chamber. Okay, it could be on the water seal chamber or the air seal chamber. Discussion of this will be on the succeeding slides. Also, if your patient would have pain, positioning is done. Okay, or put proper positioning and the non-pharmacologic interventions are being done. Analgesics are also given to our patients to relieve them of the pain experience. Okay, so this procedure or this slide demonstrates to you how thoracentesis is done. So in this slide, you can see the thoracentesis, a needle is being inserted through the ribs of your patient. And then caution is taken in such a way that the diaphragm and the lungs will not be accidentally punctured. Okay? If there are a lot of fluid, there will be a drainage container. And this is what we refer to as your thoracostomy tube earlier. So there will be an insertion of your thoracostomy tube towards a drainage. And the purpose of that is to continuously drain the contents of your pleural cavity. As previously discussed, the best position for this surgery is for your patient to be on orthopnic or seating position, which would allow for proper lung expansion and at the same time, the fluids will be settled on the lower part by gravity. Then we have several drainage system kinds. So in this case, we can have the water seal drainage system. Take note that the drainage system could be one bottle, two bottle, or three bottles. If it is a one bottle system, it will be a water seal in drainage bottle alone. If it is a two bottle system, the first bottle acts as a water seal in drainage. The second bottle usually acts as a suction control bottle. On the other hand, if there is a three bottle system, the first is a drainage, the second is the water seal bottle, and then the third is a suction control bottle. This one uh, shows your pleuroperitoneal shunt. Okay, so as shown, there is a tube that is being inserted to your pleural cavity and then it goes towards your peritoneum. Your peritoneum would allow for the drainage of these fluids. Then this is your pleurodesis. Again, the purpose of your pleurodesis is to create adhesions or in other words, the formation of your scar tissues. The formation of the scar tissues here will prevent the deposits of your fluids in the pleural space and then it would allow the lung to fully expand. So take note that for the medication to be properly distributed during pleurodesis or during chemical pleurodesis, your patient will be asked to reposition. Usually, the chest tube will be clamped for 60 to 90 minutes and the purpose of that is for the medication to stay in the patient's pleural cavity first. Okay, to allow for the medication to form adhesions, although the procedure needs to be repeated several times. So again, the purpose is formation of adhesions or scar formation or to obliterate the pleural space and prevent reaccumulation of fluids. Now, let's talk about pneumothorax. So we've already discussed three conditions. So you have your pleuritis. The second one is your uh, Pleural effusion, and then the third one now is your pneumothorax. Recall in pleuritis, our problem is simply inflammation. In your pleural effusion, the problem is abnormal collection of fluids. For pneumothorax, the problem will be deposit of air. Okay, Your pneumothorax is abnormal presence of air in the pleural space, hence referred to as pneumothorax. Okay, so let's have the pathophysiology of your pneumothorax. So there are several kinds of your pneumothorax. Okay, your pneumothorax could be caused by either of the following. It could be caused by the breach of the pleura. It could also be caused by air entry to the pleural space. And it could also be caused by a lacerated lung. Now, risk factors. Interstitial lung disease and emphysema could lead to the breach of the pleura. Take note that in emphysema, there is air trapping. The tendency of the air being trapped by our patient's lungs is for it to rupture okay, or become a bronchopleural fistula. Okay, so it's possible that the bleb of air would rupture or it is also possible that there is a bronchopleural fistula. A bronchopleural fistula would be an abnormal passageway between the lungs and the pleura and the pleura cavity. Okay, so other cause could be air entry to the pleural space. The air entry to the pleural space could be caused by a blunt trauma, which could be because of your rib, uh, rib fracture. 
if there is fracture of the ribs, the tendency of the fracture is to puncture the lungs, the, the puncture the lungs and the pleural cavity. Hence, the presence of abnormal air. It could be because also of penetrating injury, diaphragmatic tear just due to surgery, thoracentesis, which is the insertion of your needle. Also, could be a complication of your biopsy. Also, a complication of subclavian line insertion and your barotrauma. When we say baro, baro refers to pressure. So, barotrauma is usually caused by excessive pressure brought about by mechanical ventilation. So, if there is too much pressure from the mechanical ventilator, it could also lead to abnormal presence of air. Then you have your lacerated lungs. So, the laceration of the lungs could be caused by the small opening or wound in the chest wall. The causes is almost the same with the second box here illustrated. However, the main difference between this traumatic and tension pneumothorax is that in tension pneumothorax, there is air trapping. Whereas in your traumatic pneumothorax, there is no air trapping. What happens in traumatic pneumothorax is that it occurs when the air escapes from the laceration and then the wound is large enough to allow also for the excretion or going out of the air when the patient is inhaling. So in traumatic pneumothorax, uh, air could go in and out of the thoracic cavity. Again, air could go in and out of the thoracic cavity. So these three text boxes here demonstrate the three kinds of pneumothorax. Your simple pneumothorax, traumatic pneumothorax, and tension pneumothorax. Simple pneumothorax, there is no injury. It could be simply caused by a rupture of a bleb. In your traumatic pneumothorax, what happens is that there is trauma. Okay, there is trauma that occurred. So what happens is that the trauma is too big for the air to go in and out of the lungs if the patient is breathing in and out. In your tension pneumothorax, there is a wound that allows for air entry. However, it does not allow for air to go out whenever the patient is inhaling or exhaling. Hence, it's referred to as tension pneumothorax, characterized by air trapping. Now, so this slide would differentiate okay, between the open pneumothorax and your tension pneumothorax. If you would look at traumatic pneumothorax, there would be two kinds. For your traumatic pneumothorax, it could be leading towards your hemothorax. When I say hemothorax, the deposits of blood in your thoracic cavity, and then open pneumothorax. So when I say open pneumothorax, the wound of the patient is just open, which allows for free movement of the air. If you would look at the signs and symptoms, there is sucking chest wall. And then there is what we refer to as mediastinal flatter or swing. Your mediastinal flatter is shifting of the heart and the great vessels towards the uninjured side with each inspiration and in opposite direction during expiration. So if you can notice, if the patient is doing inspiration, okay, the patient's lung will be able to move or the patient's mediastinum is moving towards the unaffected side. Okay, it's moving towards the unaffected side. However, during expiration, it allows for the movement towards the affective side, okay, or affected side, I mean. This is because of the presence of the open wound. Okay, presence of an open wound here, which allows for the movement of air. Whereas in your tension pneumothorax, if you can notice, there is already presence of mediastinal shift. Okay? There is entry of air, however, air is not going out of the thoracic cavity through the wound. The, the wound is only small enough to allow for the air to enter, however, it's not big enough to allow for the air to go out of the thoracic cavity. So what happens? There is collection or trapping of the air inside the thoracic cavity. If you can notice, there is only increase of amount of air on the affected lung. Because of the increase of the amount of air on the affected lung, the mediastinum is shifting towards the unaffected side. Again, the mediastinum will be shifting towards the unaffected side. So that is your tension pneumothorax. Assessment findings. So for the assessment findings, there will be decrease of breath sounds. That is brought about by the elevation or collapse of your lung tissues. So you will only be having the air, hence decrease of breath sounds. Upon palpation or upon percussion, I mean, there will be hyperresonance. Remember that the normal lung sound during percussion is resonance. 
So there will be hyper resonance due to the increase of air. Affected side of the chest tends to become prominent. Okay, it tends to become prominent. It tends to be bulging or enlarged. However, the movement of that part is poor because it is not the lung expanding but only the air outside the lungs. There will be tracheal deviation. Okay, it, the tracheal deviation is away from the affected side if it is a closed pneumothorax, whereas it is towards the affected side if it is an open pneumothorax. Again, it is away from the affected side if closed pneumothorax, and then towards the affected side if it is an open pneumothorax. Other than that, pleuritic pain is also expected. So pleuritic pain tends to be sudden. Your patient may have tachypnea due to the decreased lung capacity. Due to the decreased lung capability, the tendency of your patient is to breathe faster. Then there will be also presence of subcutaneous emphysema, which will be the air trapping on the subcutaneous tissue. Because of that, you would expect the finding of crepitus. Clinical picture of these patients would usually manifest with air hunger. They become agitated due to hypoxia, increasing hypoxemia. There will be central cyanosis. So in central cyanosis, the lips of your patient would be discolored along with the organs okay, or along with the central part of the body. Hypotension or decrease of your blood pressure while your heart is trying to compensate using your tachycardia. And there will be profuse diaphoresis. Then, tension pneumothorax. This finding is specific to tension pneumothorax. There will be asymmetry of the thorax. The trachea will be deviated away from the affected side. Again, it will be away from the affected side. Because take note, in tension pneumothorax, there is deposition of air or again, air trapping inside the thoracic cavity. So because the air is trapped in the affected side, the tendency is for the air to compress Okay, or for the air to compress the mediastinum to go towards the unaffected side. It goes towards the unaffected side or away from the affected side. Patient would also have signs and symptoms of respiratory distress. There will be absence of breath sounds on the affected side. There will be distended neck veins. This is brought about by the compression of the mediastinum, which does not allow for the free flow of blood going towards your superior vena cava and inferior vena cava. Hence, the tendency of the neck veins to be dilated or distended. Cyanosis would also occur because of the lack of blood supply due also to the impediment caused by your mediastinal shift. And then you can have hypertympanic sound during percussion. So again, this is a review of the types of your pneumothorax. So again, there are three types, simple, traumatic, and tension pneumothorax. Let's try to go to some of the diagnostic test management. Okay, for the diagnostic test, chest x-ray and ultrasound is done. This should be done stat because your pneumothorax is considered to be an emergency procedure okay, or an emergency condition. If your patient would have traumatic pneumothorax or tension pneumothorax, as an emergency protocol, you need to cover the puncture site or the stab wound site right away, or else it will aggravate the condition of your patient. Take note that what happens to your patient is that there will be entry to the pleural cavity, there will be a rise in chest pressure, and because of this rise in chest pressure, there will be decrease in vital capacity of your lungs. And when I talk the vital lung capacity, it talks about your, your uh, reserve volume, specifically your inspiratory reserve volume, your expiratory reserve volume, and your tidal volume. All of this decrease would lead towards hypoxemia, would lead toward decreased peripheral tissue perfusion, and decreased, peri uh, decreased tissue perfusion to your vital organs. So what will be the management? We need to do thoracentesis, okay? And there will be chest tube insertion. Thoracentesis is commonly done if we're talking about hemothorax. But oftentimes, if it is pneumothorax combined with hemothorax, we would need to have your chest tube insertion. Okay, and you will have your CTT or chest tube thoracostomy. You would have again chest tube thoracostomy. As the term implies thoracostomy, meaning a hole will be made through the thorax in such a way that the contents or abnormal contents of the thorax will be released from the thoracic cavity. 
Okay, ABG could also be done. The purpose of your ABG is, of course, to evaluate the oxygenation status of your patient. Now, decompression. One procedure is decompression. In decompression, the chest tube is being inserted to the fourth intercostal space. The purpose of this is to have an access to a water seal drainage system until the lung would reinflate. Again, fourth ICS for the purpose of inserting a water seal drainage system until the lung would reinflate. Thoracentesis would be done. Emergency thoracotomy will be done. High concentration of oxygen will be administered. In your high concentration of oxygen, there might be a need to administer it by, via your bag valve mask. The purpose of your bag valve mask, the purpose of your bag valve mask is to allow for the expansion of the lungs. And then you could also have your pulse oximeter to monitor the oxygen saturation of your patient. Next, for hemothorax. For hemothorax, which means that there is a deposit of blood in the thoracic cavity, front and back chest tubes will be inserted. Okay, it should be carefully monitored, and then chest x-ray serial evaluation is done. When I say serial evaluation, meaning several x-rays are taken in different time period for the doctor to evaluate if the contents of the thorax, thorax I mean, have already been drained. Okay, so there needs to be serial evaluation. Then, open thoracotomy may be done if the loss is about 1,500 to 2,000 ml. Okay, or if the blood loss is about 1,500 to 2,000 ml, and then there is persistent bleeding at the rate of 200 ml per hour for three hours. So if the bleeding is present, there needs to be an open thoracotomy. The purpose of your open thoracotomy is to ligate the blood vessels there which are actively bleeding. So as shown here, okay, you have BATS, your video assist assisted thoracic surgery, and then you can have your open thoracotomy. So in open thoracotomy, as you can see, the thoracic cavity is open. Okay, that is to check for the source of bleeding to stop the bleeding sources. Okay, this is the insertion of your chest tube. If you cannot this, okay, the chest tube is inserted or there are two chest tubes inserted. So you have your hemothorax and then your pneumothorax managed for this one. If you can notice, there is a chest tube inserted on the upper part and then a chest tube inserted on the lower part. The chest tube on the lower part is expected to drain air. It is placed on the upper part because we are expecting the air to be on the upper part of the lungs. On the other hand, by gravity, would expecting blood to be on the lower part of the lung. Hence, you would have your hemothorax tube usually inserted on the lower part of the lung. So this is why oftentimes the patient would ask, why do I have two tubes or three tubes? So this is your explanation. The upper tube would allow for drainage of air or pneumothorax, and then the lower tube would allow for the drainage of your blood or hemothorax. Now, let's review again on the chest drainage system. So you have your one bottle system, two bottle system, and then three bottle system. Let's go over these systems one by one for you to understand its purpose. So in a one bottle system, this tube here is connected towards your patient. The purpose of the water here is to provide a water seal for your patient. What do I mean by that? If there will be just a tube inserted to your patient and the tube is not immersed in water, the tendency is for the air from the atmosphere to go through the tube and go inside your patient's lung. To prevent that from occurring, we have what you call your water seal. It is as if the water seals our tube. But look at the process. If your patient would have pneumothorax, okay, every time that the patient's lung would expand, the excess air in the lung or the thoracic cavity would go out and that would manifest as bubbles, okay? meaning it allows or this setup allows for the air to go out from the lungs going towards the tube. It allows for the air to go out of the lungs going towards the tube. However, it prevents atmospheric air from entering going towards your lungs. That's the purpose of your water seal. Again, it allows for the entry of air from your patient going towards the tube. Or again, it allows for drainage. The more appropriate term will be drainage. It allows for drainage of air from your patient going towards the tube. And then it prevents entry of atmospheric air going towards your patient. 
So you might be asking, what is the purpose of this tube here? This would allow movement of air to the atmosphere. And at times, this is also attached to suction. If your patient would have hemothorax in a single tube setup, it is both the, the, uh, it is both the air and the blood which will be draining in this container. Next, your two bottle setup. For your two bottle setup, it has the purpose of the first bottle will be serving as your drainage bottle, as I previously emphasized, and then your second bottle will be your water seal bottle. So in your drainage bottle, it is where your patient's fluids okay, would be extracted from or drained to. So you will have your blood here. You can have the um, pleural effusion fluid here. You could also have your air pass through here. Okay, and then the second tube will be going towards the second bottle, which will serve as your water seal bottle. If you would look at these tubes here, class, it should be airtight. Okay, usually it is made of rubber. It only allows the tube to pass through. And there is a strict airtight there to prevent air entry. Okay, so the second bottle would have the underwater seal. It would have intermittent bubbling, and then it would go to your suction bottle. Now, in a three-bottle setup, Okay, the first bottle is your drainage bottle, the second bottle will be your water seal bottle, and then your third bottle is your suction bottle. Okay, or sometimes they refer to that one as your manometer bottle. Okay, so in this condition class, or in this setup, what happens is that the contents of the thoracic cavity, may that be the blood, may that be the air, is drained through here. And then, it would be drained going towards your second bottle, which would be the water seal, Okay, especially the air, it would be going towards the second bottle. Okay, again, with the same purpose. It drains the air but prevents atmospheric air to enter. And then you would have your suction bottle. You might be wondering, what are we suctioning? Okay, commonly, we use the suction if our patient has a malignant pleural effusion or our patient would have hemothorax. Okay, now, with these bottles in mind, okay, one of your nursing responsibility is to ensure that these bottles are airtight. Because if these bottles are not airtight, you are adding insult to the injury of our patient. So part of your nursing responsibility is to ensure that there will be a standby clean bottle with clean water inside the patient's room. The purpose of the bottle with water or clean water is that in case of accidental breakage of this bottle system, you can immediately immerse the tube from the patient to the water seal, which would prevent accidental or prevent further entry of atmospheric air towards the patient's thorax. So again, the purpose of having a bottle with water in the patient's bedside is to ensure that in case of emergency or uh, accidental breakage of this bottle, it can be placed, the tube of the patient can be placed or immersed inside the water in such a way that the atmospheric air would be prevented to enter to the patient's thorax. Other emergency things that you need to prepare at the bedside, you also need to have vaselinized gauze. Your vaselinized gauze can be used if the patient's tube from the chest was detached. If there is accidental detachment of the tube, you need to cover the puncture site, you need to cover the insertion site with the vaselinized gauze so that it will prevent the air from entering the patient's body. One of the rules is that your chest tube should always be lower than your patient's body. So you are not supposed to place the chest tube on the bedside table because if you are placing it at the bedside table above your patient's body, the tube will not be able to drain the abnormal contents of the thorax. Now, on bubbling. For bubbles, you would expect the presence of intermittent bubbling in your water seal chamber. Okay, water seal chamber. If your patient would have pneumothorax, you would expect initially to have continuous bubbling. Okay, and then later on, it will gradually be reduced as the pneumothorax is becoming to be resolved. However, if your patient has hemothorax, what you are expecting only is blood or fluids to be going out on the drainage system. Once you will see air or pneumo, once you will see air or continuous bubbling in the water seal chamber, you would already suspect that your patient is having pneumothorax in addition to the hemothorax. Okay? So again, 
expected is for you to have intermittent bubbling on the water seal container. Okay, intermittent bubbling is expected. If the bubbling is continuous, that means that the patient has a newly developed pneumothorax or the patient has just had a pneumothorax which is about to be resolved. Next, you have your suction bottle. For suction bottle, continuous bubbling is expected because that bottle or container is attached to suction. Okay? That is all for your chest tube drainage and your chest tube systems. So, I hope that you will try to remember those concepts. If you would want to understand more about the chest tube, feel free to search online on the videos that show on how they are managed. There are also commercial, there are also commercially available chest tube bottle containers which would allow already for a disposal of these containers. Unlike in the past, we only use your uh, containers or bottles which are recycled or used from other sources. That will be the end of this discussion. However, in every end, we expect a new beginning. So see you in the next lecture.